Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This is Basketball History 101 with Rick Loiza. Welcome back to Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network. I am your host, Rick Loiza, and this is the podcast where we bring to life some of the forgotten stories from basketball history. And today, we are going to share the story of friendship. I'm going to share a little bit more about myself here. In addition to being a huge fan of basketball, obviously, I am also a big movie buff. I watch all kinds of movies, from every genre imaginable. I am a huge fan of visual storytelling. Now, with that said, one of my favorite movies of all time is The Shawshank Redemption. If you go to imdb.com, it is the highest rated movie ever on their website. It has a 9.2 rating out of 10 from thousands and thousands of reviews. It is an incredibly well-told story of a friendship between two men who find themselves behind bars. The movie stars Morgan Freeman as Red, and he befriends Andy Dufresne, played by Tim Robbins who was wrongly convicted. The two develop the kind of friendship that makes almost any man wish he had a friend like that. A guy who has your back no matter what. Well, this is the basketball version of that story. Our story begins with Maurice Stokes. He only played in the NBA for three seasons before his career was cut short, but for those three years, he was one of the greatest to ever play the game. In just those three years, Big Mo won the Rookie of the Year award in 1956, He made it to three All-Star games, and he was named second team All-NBA all three years, meaning that he was one of the top ten best players in the league for all three seasons that he played. He led the league in total rebounds in 1957 and was second in assists to Bob Cousy. For his professional career, he averaged 16.4 points and 17.3 rebounds per game. At 6 foot 7 and 232 pounds, he was an absolute beast to deal with for anyone who had to guard him. He was the complete package. He scored, he rebounded, and he was a playmaker setting up his teammates with assists. He was the total basketball package. But I want to take you back to the beginning of his story. He was born in Rankin, Pennsylvania on June 17, 1933. He was raised by two hardworking parents in the Pittsburgh area as one of four children. He had a twin sister and two brothers. Just as is common with most professional athletes, he was bigger, faster, stronger, and more athletic than most of the other children in his neighborhood. This led him to star at Westinghouse High School, where he averaged 27 points and 26 rebounds per game. With Stokes leading the way, the team won back-to-back Pittsburgh City Championships in 1950 and 1951. Unfortunately, he was not recruited as much as you would think. Back then, most colleges followed an unwritten rule that said you could only have one or two black players on your team. So for a great player like Stokes, the bar was higher than for white players because he was competing for fewer spots than other players were. Many of the powerhouse schools looked at him at being just below that super elite level of player. But there was one school that sought him out. That school was St. Francis College in Loretto, Pennsylvania. They wanted Stokes so badly that they signed Stokes' teammate, Ed Fleming, as a way of getting Stokes. They figured with Fleming on the team, he would feel much more comfortable knowing that a friend was going with him. And it worked. Stokes decided to accept a scholarship to St. Francis. He accomplished a lot as a player at St. Francis. This was a team that had never performed particularly well, but with Stokes on the team, they made it to the 1954 and 1955 NIT tournaments. 
This was huge for St. Francis. Stokes was named the MVP of the 1955 tournament even though St. Francis had finished in fourth place. That's how much of an impact he had made. He had proven himself to be one of the best college players in the entire country. After four years at St. Francis, he entered the NBA draft in 1955 and was chosen second overall by the Rochester Royals. In the second round, the Royals selected Jack Twyman from the University of Cincinnati. Twyman will play an incredible role in the life of Maurice Stokes. Now, as a side note, in the third round of the draft, the Royals selected Ed Fleming, the high school and college teammate of Stokes. Now, they would become teammates in the NBA as well. As for Stokes, he came into the NBA and dominated from day one. He averaged 16 points and 16 rebounds that very first year in Rochester and the rest of the league took notice of this rookie who was dominating nearly every game he played in. In their second year in the NBA, Twyman joined Stokes in the All-Star game, giving the Royals two young and elite players. Their future looked really bright. For their third year, the team pulled up stakes and moved the club from Rochester, New York to Cincinnati, Ohio, where they would become the Cincinnati Royals. In that third year, both Stokes and Twyman made the All-Star game again, both averaging 16 points per game, with Stokes adding 18 rebounds per game as well. The team looked like it would give the St. Louis Hawks and the Boston Celtics a run for their money, as those were the dominant teams in the league. And that's when Stokes' career took a turn for the worst. In the final game of the regular season, they were in Minneapolis to play the Lakers. The date was March 12, 1958. Stokes went in for a layup and was fouled hard, and he hit his head on the floor as he landed. In interviews, players who were there say that they heard a thud like they had never heard before. Stokes was knocked unconscious. He lay there on the floor completely out. The trainer went to him immediately, and seeing Stokes' condition, the trainer decided that the best thing to do was to wake him up using smelling salts. It did the trick in that Stokes did wake up. Once they got him on his feet, he shot his free throws and finished the game. I do want to remind you that this is 1958, and we knew relatively little about head injuries back then as compared to today. While we know far more today, medical researchers continue to learn more about the impact of brain injuries. If what happened to Stokes had happened today, he would have been immediately taken out of the game and put through the concussion protocol where he would have been thoroughly evaluated and released by an independent doctor before being able to return to action. In most cases where a concussion is present, the player has to sit out several weeks until the concussion is completely healed. But again, it was not like that back in 1958. The Royals won the game and then prepared for the playoffs that was going to begin just a few days later. The first opponent was the Detroit Pistons in Game 1 in Detroit. According to Stokes' own teammates, he was just off that game. He still scored 12 points and pulled down 15 rebounds, which would have been on the low end of typical for Stokes' performance, but they knew that something was not quite right with Big Mo. He seemed a bit lethargic the entire game. They all figured that it was because of the hit he took in that previous game. Back then, they just would have said that Stokes needs some time to shake it off. Now, I played American football for my high school back in the 1990s, and I can clearly remember teammates taking extremely hard hits to the head and then just getting up and continuing to play. Even in the 1990s, we did not truly understand how serious head injuries were. A player always felt like he had to prove his toughness by going right back into the game. In retrospect, it was absolutely awful that we did that. Thankfully, none of my former teammates suffered any lifelong repercussions. Now, back to Maurice Stokes. On the flight home from Detroit is when it happened. A flight from Detroit to Cincinnati is really not that long, but it was long enough that Stokes had a seizure on the plane and was permanently paralyzed. When the plane landed in Cincinnati, he was rushed immediately to the hospital for evaluation. By the next day, they learned that Stokes had lost all control of his motor skills, except for his ability to blink his eyes and to make guttural noises. But they also learned that his mind was still perfectly clear. He was diagnosed as having encephalopathy. They developed a system of communication using his ability to blink his eyes. There was no hope that he would ever even walk again, let alone play basketball. This was the end of his playing career. He was an amazing player 
whose career was cut short in his prime. Now, this is actually a good place to take a break, and I'm going to share the rest of Stoke's story right after this. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Welcome back to the show, and now let me continue with the story of Maurice Stokes. With his paralysis, it was crucial that he get the best care available. The hospital was able to provide the best rehabilitation care available at the time, but it would be very expensive. It would cost about $6,000 per month to pay his medical bills. Now that is the equivalent of $55,000 per month in the year 2021. Stokes had about six months of savings from being a professional athlete, but that would run out very quickly. Something had to be done. Stokes' own parents did not know what to do. They did not have anywhere near the money required to take care of their son. And that was when Jack Twyman stepped in. Twyman and Stokes had been drafted together and played as teammates for three years. But according to other teammates, they were not particularly close, which is not that uncommon in professional locker rooms. In a very real sense, teammates at the professional level are more like co-workers that anyone would have in their office. You work together for about eight hours a day. You might get along really well, but that might be about it. You often leave your relationships at the office. A lot of times, it is the same way with professional teams. Most of the players have other obligations outside of the team. Many are married and have children to look after. They might even have other business commitments to attend to when they are not with the team. So many were surprised when Jack Twyman stepped up. In order to make this work financially, Twyman flew to Pittsburgh to meet with Mr. and Mrs. Stokes to discuss how they would take care of Maurice. Twyman offered to become Big Mo's legal guardian in order to administer funds on his behalf and make sure that the medical bills were paid. It was an enormous offer and a huge responsibility. Mr. and Mrs. Stokes hesitated to allow Twyman to assume that responsibility. But Twyman reminded them that of anyone on the team, he was the only one who lived in Cincinnati full time. That meant that he would be around during the off season to help take care of Maurice. They finally accepted Twyman's offer. And that's when the real work began for Twyman, who worked tirelessly to raise money to help pay Stokes medical bills. Even though he was a professional athlete, NBA players did not make that much more money in the 1950s as compared to a regular corporate employee. NBA players made hardly more than a good salesman or an accountant, and Twyman had to get to work. That was when he got an unexpected phone call from a man named Milton Kutcher. He owned a resort in the Catskill Mountains in upstate New York called Kutcher's Country Club and Hotel. And if you are a regular listener of this show, I just shared the story of Kutcher's in our previous episode, and that was by design. I wanted to give you a full episode on Kutcher's as the background for this episode so that I wouldn't have to explain the whole story again. So, you know that Milton Kutcher was well connected in NBA circles. So a man named Haskell Cohen, the public relations director of the NBA, along with Kutcher and Twyman, came up with a great idea of raising money for Marie Stokes. They would put on a charity basketball game with all of the proceeds going to pay medical bills. Today, many NBA players organize charity games in the offseason to raise money for a good cause. Well, that idea started with this game. This was the first one of its kind. Cohen would work with the NBA to help promote the game. Twyman and Kutcher would make phone calls to get some of the biggest stars of the NBA to participate in this game. Each of the players would have to pay their own cost for traveling to the resort, but once there, Kutcher would provide free lodging and free meals to the players. So that summer of 1958, they put on the very first Maurice Stokes charity basketball game. Now these were just a few of the players that showed up for that game. Wilt Chamberlain, Tom Gola, Wayne Embry, Bill Russell, Bob Cousy, and Twyman himself. The star power that showed up for this game rivaled the actual NBA All-Star game. It was a huge hit. They actually had the players play a series of games to accommodate the demands for tickets. They did the whole thing again for the next several summers. In the end, the Maurice Stokes games raised around $750,000 for Stokes and other players who were also in financial need. But Twyman was not finished. He called Sports Illustrated to do a cover story on Big Mo, 
and the charity game. The story alone raised another $200,000. He also convinced famous sportscaster Howard Cosell to talk about the story on his radio show, and that raised another $50,000. Twyman was absolutely unstoppable when it came to raising money to help pay for Stokes' bills, and he would sometimes even travel to another city to raise funds and then fly back to Cincinnati just in time to play a game that night. Remember, while Twyman worked tirelessly to raise funds, he was still a full-time basketball player who was married with a couple of kids. It was not just fundraising that he did. He would visit Stokes in the hospital nearly every single day to check on Big Mo. He would also bring Stokes into the Twyman house every Sunday night for dinner. Stokes was also at the Twyman house for holidays like Thanksgiving, Easter, Christmas, birthdays, and such. Stokes became a big part of the Twyman family. For Stokes' part, he attacked his physical therapy with the effort and focus of an elite professional athlete. He would often come back to his room pouring with sweat from his long and grueling therapy. His goal was to get as healthy as possible. To an extent, it worked. He was able to regain some ability in his speech and he was able to regain some movement in his limbs. He was even able to stand on his own with leg braces. It was an incredible accomplishment considering where the seizure had left him. However, by the late 1960s, he began to deteriorate again. Sadly, 12 years after his injury, he passed away from a heart attack. He died on April 6, 1970 at the age of 36. At his own request, he was buried in the cemetery on the campus of his alma mater, St. Francis College. But before he passed, he was on hand at St. Francis when they renamed the basketball gym. It is now known as the Marie Stokes Athletic Center. Back at Kutcher's, the charity basketball game continued under a new format. Trying to get insurance to put on a charity game featuring highly paid athletes was becoming prohibitively expensive. It was eating up most of the proceeds. With Will Chamberlain becoming more and more involved, it became the Marie Stokes slash Will Chamberlain charity golf tournament. It was much easier to get insurance for golf than it is for basketball. The golf tournament continued to raise money for many athletes who found themselves unable to pay medical bills. In the end, Twyman raised over one million dollars to help pay those medical bills for Marie Stokes. Again, this was the late 1950s and 1960s. This was an incredible sum of money to raise back then, and he did this all while playing 11 seasons of NBA basketball with six appearances in the All-Star game. For his accomplishments on the court, Twyman was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 1983. It was a well-deserved honor. Thankfully, in 2004, the Hall of Fame committee sought fit to induct Marie Stokes into the Hall of Fame as well. And even though he only played three seasons, he played at a level that very few players ever do. And now this is where I sometimes play the what if game. What if Stokes had gone into the concussion protocol instead of being sent right back into that faithful game? Would he have been able to have a full career? Just a couple of years after Stokes was injured, the Royals drafted Oscar Robertson. Could you imagine Stokes, Robertson, and Twyman leading the Royals? They would have been able to take a couple of championships off of the Celtics. Or what if he had been on another team? Would there have been someone like Jack Twyman to step up and help take care of him? In any case, I believe that if Maurice Stokes had been able to have a full career, we would have been talking about him as one of the greatest power forwards the game has ever seen. I am just glad that both Stokes and Twyman will both be remembered as members of the Hall of Fame. Twyman spoke on Stokes' behalf during the enshrinement ceremony in 2004. Twyman delivered an incredibly heartfelt speech. It showed the love that these two men had for each other. It is hard to get through that speech without getting emotional, and I'll put a link to that speech in the description. Now I want to share one last story of these two men. Back during the early years of Stokes' rehabilitation, he had begun to regain movement in his arms, but not his speech yet. He asked for a typewriter so that he could begin to type out letters. The IBM Corporation donated a newfangled electric typewriter for him. The first letter he typed out was to Jack Twyman. It took him a full week to type it out. And I'm going to read that letter 
in its entirety. It said, Dear Jack, how can I ever repay you? Maurice. That's it. That took an entire week for him to do. Well, Twyman cashed in on that offer. Twyman announced his retirement with the conclusion of the 1966 season. The team decided to have Jack Twyman night to honor him. Twyman insisted that Stokes come to the game and sit on the bench with the rest of the team, and the fans gave Stokes an ovation when he was announced. It was the closure that he never got when his playing career ended. It was an incredible night for both men. Twyman sadly also passed away on May 30th, 2012 at the age of 78. But that still isn't the end of their story. With the passing of Twyman, the folks at the NBA decided to create a new award to be given out annually. Team executives nominate 12 players each year for this award. The winner is then determined by a vote of the players. It is called the Twyman Stokes Teammate of the Year Award. It has been given out every year since 2013. And here is the list of the winners in order. Chauncey Billups, Shane Battier, Tim Duncan, Vince Carter, Dirk Nowitzki, Jamal Crawford, Mike Connolly, Drew Holiday, and this year's winner, Damian Lillard. It is a great way to keep alive the memory of these two men and their incredible friendship. Very rarely do people find someone who has their back the way Jack Twyman did for Marie Stokes. And I hope this story inspires you. I know that it has inspired me to be a better friend to those around me. Life is too short not to have good friends around you. If you have a chance to have someone else's back, do it. Now that's our story for today. Join us next week when we share the story with an Olympic theme as we get ready to watch the 2020 Tokyo Games. We will share the story of the Yugoslavian basketball team and their breakup during the fall of Eastern European Communism. That's next time on Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network, the headquarters of Sports Yesteryear. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com to find out more about this and other sports history podcasts. If you like what you hear, please hit that subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts. Also, go ahead and give us a rating and review, and that will help others to find this podcast more easily. And check out our page on Facebook. It's called Basketball History 101 Podcast. There you will find shorter historical posts, as well as comments and discussion starters on today's game. I'll also announce there when new episodes come out. I want to thank my producer and editor, Jacob Loiza. Join us each week as we continue to mine the history of basketball for more great stories from the past. Take care, and see you soon. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football, Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s, Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports, Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.